Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining and for so for some introductions. Uh, I'm Emin, I'm main trainer at uh, GoUp currently, and this this talk is going to be basically a high level overview of the things about operating system development and concept. And uh, also, I will I will do some uh, practical practical things also. And so, uh, specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about hardware components for first. Firstly, uh, for, um, then I will talk about operating system concept and development toolkit and safety in operating system development with Rust and uh, CLAN++. Start from, start with hardware components. Uh, so, uh, the main parts of uh, hardware components are memory management unit and interrupt controller and clock or timers or counters and <coughs> sorry, input or output devices and storage devices and PCI or USB devices and network devices. Uh, each of these is used by the OS to do specific tasks. And that's why the OS has a few software mechanisms that control these hardware components such as uh, memory manager and scheduler and multitasking or multiprocessing uh, mechanism or concept, uh, system calls and device drivers and bootloader. Uh, let's start with memory management unit. Uh, memory management unit is a computer hardware component that handles all memory associated with the CPU. Uh, so the memory management unit is responsible for, for all aspects of memory management. It, and it, it's usually integrated into the processor. Uh, in the modern processors, uh, MMU uh, and memory management unit actually performs translations and virtual memory management. For example, the page table block unit, as you can see. Uh, so, which contains a logic, logic address uh, that reads the translation tables from memory and then uh, translate logical address to a physical address. And MMU also handles at the same time uh, memory protection and cache control. For example, any user process uh, uh, wants to read uh, kernel memory, uh, memory management unit will cause a fault or trap uh, because uh, the user process privilege level is different than the kernel privilege level. So memory management facilities of Intel architecture uh, actually uh, are divided uh, into two parts. Um, uh, for, firstly, it's uh, segmentation and uh, paging. Uh, segmentation provides a mechanism of isolating a individual code and data and stack modules so that multiple programs can run on the same processor without interfering uh, with each other. Uh, but a paging system is a system, uh, paging is a system which, which uh, allows each uh, process to see uh, to see a full uh, virtual address space without actually requiring the uh, full amount of uh, physical memory to be present 
or available. And uh, in addition uh, to this, paging introduced the benefit of page level protection. So the system provides hardware-based isolation. Uh, okay, so user process can only see and modify data uh, that's paged in in on their own address space. In this case, on the uh, on the Intel architecture, page level protection now now completely supersize segmentation as the memory protection mechanism on the uh, 64 architecture and on the 32 architecture uh, both paging and segmentation exit exist but segmentation is uh, considered uh, legacy mm. also there is a 20 line in the real mode uh, we have to we have to activate a 20 uh, line actually a 20 a 21st line to access uh, up to uh, one me megabyte memory and we will talk about the a 20 uh, about uh, a 20 line in the bootloader slide uh, let's pass it Okay, uh, interrupt controller. Interrupt uh, is a signal from a device such as keyboard and external I.O. device to CPU and telling it to immediately stop whatever it's currently doing. And for example, the keyboard controller sends an interrupt when a, when a keyboard key presses key is pressed any key is pressed for example enter and uh, to to know how to call how to call on the kernel when a specific interrupt arises the CPU has a table called uh, interrupt descriptor table which which is uh, uh, which is a vector table uh, set up by the OS and store it in memory. Actually, there are uh, 256 uh, interrupt vectors on the uh, Intel CPUs, uh, numbered from zero to 255, and which act as uh, entry points to the kernel and uh, and okay uh, when the interrupt controller sends an uh, sends an interrupt to the CPU the CPU will use uh, this entry table uh, interrupt descriptor table so to find the appropriate uh, entry point of interrupt to execute so uh, there are three three types of interrupt. First type is uh, exception. Uh, these are generated by uh, CPU, internally by CPU, and used to alert the running kernel of uh, some situation or event which requires uh, its attention. Uh, on Intel CPUs, uh, there are few kinds of uh, exception, uh, exception search, uh, such as uh, general protection fault and page fault, and etc. Uh, other type is uh, hardware interrupt. Uh, this type of interrupt is generated externally by the chipset. Uh, this interrupt is coming from some I.O. devices uh, to interrupt controller, uh, as you can see, and it's signaled by latching uh, onto the interrupt pin uh, or equivalent signal of the CPU, like this. 
and other type other type uh, interrupt uh, is uh, software interrupt this is an interrupt signal by software running on a CPU to indicate that that uh, it, it needs the kernel's uh, attention and these types of interrupts are generally used for system calls and on x86 uh, uh, CPUs the instruction which is used to initiate a software uh, interrupt is uh, is the int instruction. Uh, yep, example uh, Linux kernel uses OX80 uh, for interrupt. Okay, we will talk about it in the next slides. Uh, actually, okay. Uh, actually, all okay. Actually, all hardware-based uh, interrupts are transferred uh, through a programmable interrupt controller to CPU. Basically, when a, as I said, when a key is pressed, uh, the keyboard controller tells a, a device called programmable interrupt controller to cause uh, an interrupt. Uh, the eight thousand two. 151 uh, programmable interrupt control controls controller uh, controls the, the CPU interrupt mechanism by by uh, accepting several interrupt uh, interrupt requests and feed feeding them to the processor. Uh, for example, when a keyboard uh, registers a key heat. Uh, it sends a uh, uh, pulse uh, along its uh, interrupt uh, request line, uh, interrupt line, to to uh, programmable interrupt controller or interrupt controller, which uh, then translates the interrupt request into the uh, CPU and so the system uh, interrupt uh, or had the interrupt and sends a message to, to CPU. Uh, part of kernel jobs is to handle this uh, interrupt, re interrupt request uh, and perform the necessary procedures uh, and uh, example and or uh, alerted uh, some user space program to the interrupt. So without programmable interrupt controller, we 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 have to pull all device in the system to see if they want to do any anything. Um, but with a programmable interrupt controller, uh, our system. Uh, can run along nicely uh, until such time that the device uh, wants wants to signal an event, which mean which means you, you you don't waste time going to the device. So, as you can see, we, uh, modern modern intro, uh, Intel processors replace it. Uh, programmable interrupt controller uh, with uh, advanced pro, uh, programmable interrupt controller. So it's used in multiprocessor systems and is an integral part of all uh, recent Intel processors. The APIC uh, interrupt, uh, advanced programmable interrupt controller is used for sophisticated interrupt redirection and for sending interrupts between uh, processors, as you can see, uh, each uh, CPU, uh, each CPUs have own uh, own local APIC, and uh, 
Okay. There are two components in the Intel APIC system and the first local APIC uh, and the second is uh, IO APIC and there is one local APIC uh, in each CPU in the system so which means each uh, processor has local APIC as I say you can see okay <clears throat> in original system designs uh, the local APIX and uh, input output APIX were connected by dedicated uh, system bus, dedicated APIC bus actually, or system bus. And newer systems uh, use the system bus for communication between all uh, APIC components or IO devices. And pro okay, uh, actually, that's all about interrupt controllers. And next topic is timers. Uh, timers, uh, programmable interval timer. Uh, actually, Intel has some timers. Uh, call, uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, programmable interval timer. Actually, we use programmable interval timer to set up the Cisco mechanism and programmable uh, interval timer is a counter that generates an output signal when it reaches it reach, uh, programmed count and then the, this output signal uh, may uh, trigger an interrupt request to to the to CPU. So input and output devices, uh, input uh, and or output uh, de devices uh, uh, are the communication uh, between computer system with the actually input and output. Uh, is the communication between computer uh, with the outside system systems and inputs uh, are the signals uh, or data or data uh, received by the uh, computer or any system and outputs are the uh, signal uh, sent from it and in computer architecture, the combination of CPU and main memory to which the CPU can read or write directly using individual instructions. So, okay. Microprocessors normally use, uh, use two uh, methods to communicate with external devices. Uh, first uh, method is memory mapped. And second is port mapped I.O. Memory mapped I.O. is mapped into the same address space as program uh, memory, which means uh, the I.O. device is accessed like it's part of uh, <coughs> sorry uh, okay uh, uh, memory mapped I.O. Uh, as I said, is a accessed uh, like it's it's a part of memory, and uh, this means uh, this means uh, I, this means uh, I.O. device use the same address bus same address bus uh, as memory, and meaning that CPU CPU can refer to memory or IO device based on the value of the address. So port mapped uh, IO uses a separate dedicated address space and is accessed via a dedicated set, uh, set of CPU instructions. Actually, they, they are often 
very limited and often providing only for simple store load uh, operations uh, between CPU registers and IO ports. And Intel has in and out instruction set to instruction, actually, to instructions uh, for IO communication, uh, for example, and also, uh, for example, there is PC2 uh, serial, serial interface, that's type of serial communication interface, uh, typically used for user input device like keyboard, and mouse, and etc. So, okay, uh, there are few storage devices and communication and communication protocols for them. And, uh, like SATA, PETA, and DVA, uh, uh, ATA, PI. Actually, it's uh, communication protocol. And uh, PETA and parallel ATA. Uh, is a, it's an interface standard for the connection of storage device, such as hard disk, drives, and uh, as you can see, uh, floppy disk drives, and optical disk drives, etc. cetera. Uh, SATA and serial ATA is a bus interface for communicating with mass storage devices such as disk drives and actually optical drives and etc the composition is is mostly identical to beta where one controller connects to several devices using SATA cables SATA and SATA wiring is allowing uh, more um, than one device um, to be uh, to be connected to um, single cable. Okay, uh, ATA packet interface, ATA PI uh, is a protocol, so which uh, has been added to parallel uh, ATA and serial ATA. Uh, it's basically a way to, to issue uh, SCSI uh, commands to DVD or tape drive or, <coughs> sorry, uh, or attach it to the, uh, any attached uh, device to the ATA bus. So DMA, uh, is actually a main part of CPU. Uh, um, okay, is a feature in uh, modern computers uh, that allows device to to be able to move uh, large blocks of data without any interaction with the CPU and while this uh, device transfers the block of data, a large block of data and the processor is free to continue uh, running the software without uh, worry about the data being transferred into memory or to any device. The basic idea is that we can schedule the DMA device to, to perform the task on its own. And DMA has several advantages, actually. So first advantage is it's fast because dedicated piece of hardware transfers data from one 
location from one computer location to another and only one or two pass read or uh, write cycles are required per piece of data transferred and it also offloads the processor uh, which means the processor uh, doesn't have to execute any instruction to transfer data mm. and DMA controllers can transfer data to memory independently so okay other topic PCI or PCI Express so PCI uh, PCI um, is peripheral component uh, interconnect is a common connection interface for attaching computer peripherals to the CPU through the motherboard and we can see a logical diagram of uh, can this pointer yet we can see a logical diagram of uh, example PCI system here actually PCI based system the PCI buses and PCI to PCI bridges are glue are glue uh, connecting the system components together and the CPU is connected to PCI 0 and the primary PCI bus uh, as is the video device and PCI to PCI bridge uh, connects the primary bus uh, to the secondary PCI bus, as you can see. So PCI bus one to PCI bus two zero also, as you can see. Okay. Um, in the figure, this figure, uh, PCI bus one uh, as has been uh, downstream of the PCI two PCI bridge and PCI zero is upstream of the bridge and connected and connected to the secondary PCI bus are the uh, SCSI and Ethernet device for the system and physically the bridge uh, the bridge uh, secondary PCI bus and two device would all be contained uh, on the same uh, combination PCI card so PCI to uh, okay actually actually that's all let's talk about PCI configuration space it's also main topic for operating system Ooh, okay uh, the PCI specification provides for total software driven uh, initialization and configuration of each device on the PCI bus via uh, separate uh, configuration uh, address space or configuration space and all PCI device devices are required to, pro to provide uh, 256 bytes of configuration registers for this purpose and every PCI device in the system has a configuration data structure that's somewhere in the PCI configuration space. And the PCI configuration header allows the system to identify and control the device. PCI, uh, so PCI devices and bridges can be found and configured to the configured using uh, these configuration registers in their 
configuration headers and each PCI device has specific device structure and this structure um, contains few fields so first field um, is device ID identifies the particular device uh, via valid uh, IDs are located by the vendor uh, another field is vendor ID identifies the manufacturer of the device and so status command class code base address register and okay intrap line and intrap pin intrap line uh, actually specifies the which input of the system intrap controllers the devices uh, intrap pin is connected to and is implemented by any device that that make us of uh, or make us of uh, an intrap pin for example when we write uh, net, uh, when we write any data to network device uh, we we will insert firstly this intrap uh, line field to our intrap descriptor table uh, after after data was copied to memory by the network interface card it will raise an intrap pin with this intrap request line number so after that OS can be aware of this data transfer process so other field is intrap pin specifies which intrap pin uh, uh, which pin trap pin the device use so other main part is base address registers uh, okay base address register uh, can be hold to can be used sorry can be used to hold memory address uh, used by the device and or offset for port port address and typically memory address um, base address registers uh, need to be located located in physical RAM while IO space uh, base address registers can resi reside at um, any um, memory address for example uh, okay there should be okay ah, okay for example uh, we want to send any uh, network buffer example TCP packet to network device uh, we should copy this uh, buffer to memory address which we got this memory address from the base address register and so uh, after that uh, in this stage device uh, pulls the memory address this memory address until uh, data arrives so so okay actually that's all about there is some other figure on here about configuration space registers uh, and okay time to talk about bootloader so uh, when you press the power button computer um, loads the BIOS from some uh, flash uh, memory stored on the motherboard and the BIOS initializes and self tests the hardware components then loads the 512 bytes into memory from the media device and this is 
this is uh, this uh, sorry this uh, 512 uh, byte is called the bootloader that's the first part of our kernel <coughs> that can just access uh, 16 bits of memory or uh, that that's uh, uh, 64k and for example grab is a bootloader uh, that's being <laughs> used by Linux kernel and most bootloaders are written uh, exclusively in assembly because they need to be compact and they don't uh, have access to uh, OS routines uh, because there is no any OS based task in the bootloader and okay eventually eventually the actual uh, bootloading begins and then boot, uh, BIOS loads uh, our bootloader from available storage device So example, uh, CD or hard disks or, sorry, over a network with, with packs. Uh, now our bootloader can have 16 bit memory address, access, address access, as I said. Okay, that, that will be, that will be, uh, 60 64 uh, kilobyte and so in this stage our bootloader will do few tasks uh, like global descriptor table initialization and load kernel from disk to memory and etc for example initialize paging or, pro or protection mode etc bootloader could effectively address up to one megabyte or 64 kilobytes with segmented memory model uh, because there are there are 20 address lines uh, and any address above the one megabyte uh, mark wraps uh, around to zero and some old software took advantage of the fact that memory access above one megabyte uh, would wrap to lower memory and when uh, 286 processor uh, added okay added more address lines IBM uh, didn't want uh, to break the compatibility with this of the they that that's that's why they put an external gate on 21st address line and let it let off by uh, default and um, enabling the wrap around behavior uh, so all software will still function correctly and then we we have to enable uh, this uh, 21st uh, address line to to access above one megabyte. Um, example, let me show. Um, it's, it's our uh, bootloader code uh, from Delicious and bootloader. Uh, will be executed uh, from here and in here we just uh, set a 20 line with in and or uh, instruction uh, sorry uh, in uh, and out instruction uh, instructions and so then uh, get uh, some physical memory map uh, with uh, BIOS based uh, interrupt. Uh, ah, here, I think. Ah, here. Uh, with 
bios based uh, interrupt to to get system address map and to calculate our physical memory size and something and then uh, what uh, global descriptor table and set up a protected mode in here and jump to protected mode in here and after that after that we we will uh, okay we will uh, uh in here there is there is some uh, global descriptive table field uh, i will uh, i will talk in the global descriptive oh, oh, sorry segmentation talk about it and like this uh, bootloader just uh, doing some initialization procedures like as i said uh, as i said uh, protection in a protection enable protection mode or set up protected mode and get some physical address and or set up some paging and uh, long mode and that's all after that uh, it will jump to it will jump to our kernel and so uh, let's talk about memory management unit uh, more deeply and firstly talk about segmentation okay. segmentation provides a mechanism for dividing the processor's addressable memory space uh, into smaller protected address space called load segments and uh, segments uh, can be used to hold data or code and stack for a program or to hold system data structures um, such as local descriptive table sorry okay uh, so if more than uh, one task uh, is running on a processor each task can be assigned uh, its own set of uh, set of uh, segments the processor then enforce the boundaries between these segments and ensure that one program doesn't uh, interfere with the execution of another program by writing into the other program's segment. So all the segments in the all the segments in the system are contained so uh, contained in a processor's uh, liner address space and to locate a byte in particular segment or uh, and uh, logical address uh, uh, logical address um, so must be provided actually and logical address consists of segment selector and offset so you can see segment selector and offset it's logical uh, address and as i said consists of segment selector and offset uh, <coughs> uh, the segment selector is unique identifier for for a segment and it provides an offset into descriptor table like this you can see and uh, <laughs> and the segment descriptor is a data structure in, in, in global descriptor table and it has uh, it has fields few fields uh, so that, that mm, okay so that provides some uh, process uh, some information like size and 
location of a segment, as well as uh, access control and uh, uh, limit information and stops information. And each segment has a segment descriptor, which specifies the size of segment, the access rights for uh, like the, there is some access bytes, uh, the global descriptor, the global descriptor, uh, sorry, segment descriptor. And the, also the segment type and location of the first byte of the segment in the line of address space. And offset part of uh, logic, uh, logical address is added to base address for the segment to locate uh, uh, to locate a byte within the segment and or to translate to uh, to liner address and the address uh, base address plus the offset those uh, forms a liner address in the processor's liner address space and uh, let's look let's look at some uh, our kernel for initialization of global descriptor table in here for example uh, uh, code segment uh, uh, yeah code segment uh, field uh, this one one zero one zero uh, okay, uh, the, uh, the, that's type of uh, our segment, uh, as I say, it's code segment that uh, holds uh, our program's code. And, <clears throat> sorry, one, two, zero, uh, sorry, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, uh, is a code segment and it has execute or write, read. And uh, we just set uh, these bits in the our uh, uh, segment in our segment descriptor. And other uh, segment is data segment. It has one, uh, zero, zero, one, zero. The, okay. Uh, zero zero one zero it's data segment and it has read or write permission and so it's also a segment descriptor for long mode and so it it has also a DPL uh, and uh, that's that's main part for protection. That uh, specif that's, uh, DPL specifies the privilege level of the segment, and the privilege level can can range from zero to three. And, uh, it's called it's called um, ring zero or ring one, ring two, ring three is zero being uh, the most privileged privileged level and dpl actually dpl is used to control access to to the segment as i said and there is also limit field uh, uh, limit field in the uh, segment descriptor uh, like this and uh, limit uh, field uh, actually specifies the uh, uh, 20, 20 bit value tells the maximum addressable unit and it's uh, 0 o x f f f f uh, for limit uh, so base is uh, uh, 32 bit value containing uh, the liner address where where the segment our uh, segment uh, segment begins actually uh, 
So, so sorry, I mean, to okay. interrupt, we are running a bit of time. If you want, just to, if it's speed up, maybe. To... Actually, actually, okay, okay. Yeah, I think. So, so okay, okay, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, other technique for for memory management uh, is paging. It's called paging. Paging is most common technique. Use it in x86 uh, uh, processors uh, to enable virtual memory. Virtual, actually, virtual memory through paging means that each process will get the impression that the available memory from uh, available uh, memory available memory range actually is zero to four gig, and even though the actually size of memory might be much less. And it also means that when a process uh, addresses a byte of memory, it will use a virtual, uh, virtual uh, or uh, liner address instead of a physical one. And the code in the user process uh, won't uh, notice any difference. And the liner address gets translated to physical address by the memory management unit. And if the virtual address isn't mapped to a physical physical address, the CPU will raise a page fault interrupt. And paging in paging in X uh, sixty uh, sorry eighty six. Uh, consists of paging uh, directory, as you can see, and that contain reference to uh, 1024 and 1024 uh, fields, actually, page, uh, page tables, and each of which can point to 1024. And so uh, then uh, sections of physical memory uh, colored page frames and the each page frame is 4k in here and in virtual uh, address or liner address uh, the highest 10 bits specifies the uh, offset of page directory entry uh, this one here and the so the in the uh, this one specifies the uh, some entry point points to page directory, and the next ten bits of uh, offset uh, bits of offset of page table entry, and so the last uh, twelve bits. Uh, okay. So it's uh, bits in the address is the offset within the page frame to be addressed. So uh, all page directories and page tables and page frames uh, need to be aligned or uh, 4K, uh, 4K uh, addresses. And this makes it possible to address uh, pro so page directory and page table or page or page frame with just the highest uh, 20 bits of the uh, 32 bit addresses and since they lose uh, uh, 11 uh, uh, sorry 12 uh, bits uh, 12 uh, bits need to be zero so okay Pass paging stage is very uh, okay. It's, uh, you can see some paging fields for uh, page descriptor table and page descriptor entry. That's page descriptor entry. That's page, page table entry. Uh, so, next topic is uh, kernel phys physical allocators. And first allocator, uh, sorry. So uh, 
Actually, Linux kernel uses uh, body allocator for physical page allocation. That's uh, that's use uh, that's use uh, uh, before paging mechanism uh, to allocate some physical uh, memory, and the body allocator works by repeatedly splitting memory blocks in half to create two smaller uh, some uh, bodies until we get a block of desired size example we we start we use some uh, for, uh, 500 uh, uh, k block uh, allocated from the os we can split uh, to uh, sorry and we can uh, we can take take then uh, one of uh, uh, those and split it uh, further into to uh, 128k uh, bodies and so on and when allocated uh, when allocating we check to see if example here if we have a free block of appropriate size if not we split a large large block of uh, large block size as many times as necessary to get blow, to to get some, uh, a block of suitable size like this and so example so if we want to uh, if we want to allocate uh, 16k we split the split the uh, 64k uh, block into the 32 Okay, and then splits uh, split on of those into 16k uh, like this and uh, after this procedure uh, at the end of this actually the state of the allocator will look something like this so so uh, actually, actually, the, there still exists the, the problem of uh, internal fragmentation, uh, so memory lost up because the memory requested is a little larger than a small block, and but a lot of smaller than a large uh, block, and because of the of the way the memory, uh, sorry, but uh, uh, body memory allocator uh, technique works uh, a program that requests for example uh, 27k of memory will be allocated 32k and which results in waste of 5k uh, of memory so this uh, problem can be solved by uh, slab allocator that's just uh, slab allocation uh, eliminates for fragmentation caused by allocation uh, caused by allocations or the allocations process and this method is used to retain uh, to retain allocated memory that contains some uh, data object of certain uh, type for use Upon, uh, so you can see upon uh, subsequent allocations of objects of the same type. So in slab allocation, uh, memory chunks suitable to like this page. The, uh, so in a uh, memory chunks suitable to 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 feed data objects of certain types. So. The cache, uh, the, the cache, uh, this one, last cache, uh, cache and next cache. Uh, the cache doesn't free the space immediately after after use. Although, although it keeps it keeps track of data which is required frequently, so that whenever a request is made, uh, so data uh, will reach every fast, uh, very fast. So. If, if, 
So, if, uh, so internal uh, fragmentation issue can be solved with some slope allocator. And so, okay. Oh, actually, uh, Sako. Yeah. You, we should pass these days because. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think what we, we can do. We spent a lot of time to. Yeah. For them. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, I mean, I really appreciate it. And we don't have, unfortunately, time, as I said, for questions. But please yeah. write in I'm the so, meeting minutes. I'm so tired. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. I mean, I know that he spent whole week to preparing. That's really hard topic. And thank you so much. And slides thank will be you. online. And hopefully, if there is enough engagement, we can do another webinar kind, more longer session with Amy, because really for this time crunch, the topic is really tough to fit. So thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you, Amin. Uh, and let's go to Muhammad, Muhammad for the web security. Muhammad, top share.